Welcome back to the investigation of the Richest Man in Babylon book. We are discussing chapter 4, Meet the Goddess of Good Luck. Another fantastic chapter here, so we're going to go into more depth on it. And this chapter connects really well with chapter 10, which is the luckiest man in Babylon. However, their topics are actually very different. So the storyline here is that Arkad is again meeting with his students in the auditorium. And the topic of good luck is brought up. A man, one of the attendees, found a purse on the side of the road earlier that day that had gold in it. And so the question is brought up, how do we attract good luck to us? Is there a way that we can bring more good luck into our lives? So in response to this idea, Arkad says this, To some men, good luck bespeaks but a chance happening that, like an accident, may befall one without purpose or reason. Others do believe that the instigator of all good fortune is our most bounteous goddess Ashtar, ever anxious to reward with generous gifts those who please her. Now, Ashtar probably isn't the person you would look to for good luck, but maybe you have some other form of deity, or maybe you have some other form of higher power, or maybe, maybe not. The point is, is that regardless of where you think luck comes from, or if you even believe in luck, the question is, is how do we bring more luck into our lives? To this, Arkad kind of responds with a question to the entire assembly saying, how many of you know of people who have made their fortunes off of luck, whether it's through gambling or so forth? And nobody in the assembly says anything. Nobody says in the affirmative that they know of somebody. And so the question comes up, well, where do we continue our search then for this good luck? Where do we find it? And one of the attendees, a young man, um, says this, when a man speaketh of luck, is it not natural that his thoughts turn to the gaming tables? Is it not there that we find many men courting the favor of the goddess in hope she will bless them with rich winnings? We're talking gambling, whether it's lottery or, you know, slot machines or poker or whatever other games of chance you want to talk about. This is what we're talking about. And so the question is that this young man is bringing up is, well, if we got to if we're talking about luck, we really got to consider gambling. Arkad responds to this, to ignore the gaming table would be to overlook an instinct common in most men, the love of taking a chance with a small amount of silver in the hopes of winning much gold. And that's exactly what gambling is, right? You spend $3 on a lottery ticket or $5 on a lottery ticket. I don't know how much they cost. I live in a state where lotteries aren't legal. So, um, but you know, you spend a couple bucks on a lottery ticket with the hopes of winning millions, right? To this idea of, of betting on things, Arkad says this, what reason have we to feel the good goddess would take that much interest in any man's bet upon a horse? To me, she is a goddess of love and dignity, whose pleasure it is to aid those who are in need and to award those who are deserving. I look to find her not at the gaming tables or the races where men lose more gold than they win, but in other places where the doings of men are more worthwhile and more worthy of reward. Now, this discussion has nothing to do with if there is actually a higher power out there or not. This is not a theological discussion. The question is, where do we find luck? Where do we find increased financial opportunities that pay well for us? Because really, if you want to talk about financial luck, that's really what we're talking about, right? Uh, you may believe that luck is an actual force in the universe. You may believe in a deity that seeks to benefit their followers with, with certain favors. It doesn't really matter. The idea in question here is where do we find those financial prospects that bring substantial wealth? And Arkad is saying it's not at the gaming tables. It's at the places where the efforts of man are more worthy. In tilling the soil, in honest trading, in all of man's occupations, there is opportunity to make a profit upon his efforts and his transactions. Perhaps not all the time will he be rewarded because sometimes his judgment may be faulty and other times the winds and the weather may defeat his efforts. Yet, if he persists, he may usually expect to realize his profit. This is so because the chances of profit are always in his favor. This goes off of the last chapter where we talked about odds right? What are your odds of winning the lottery? It's like one in 128 million, if I remember right. What are your odds of winning a hand of blackjack? What are your odds of winning slot machines? Whatever. If you do the math, the odds are always against you. That's why the house always wins in the end. 
You may win X many hands and you may walk away. I've walked away from Vegas with more money than I started before. That doesn't mean the odds are in my favor. That means I probably had a little bit of luck and a tiny bit of skill and I knew when to walk away. You stay there long enough, you always lose. The odds are not in your favor. But when a man playeth the games, the situation is reversed for the chances of profit are always against him. So the idea here about how do we become lucky is the exact opposite of what you might think. You become lucky by not relying on luck. That's kind of the message here. And it's a really powerful message if you think about it. Because here's, okay, here's really where the true philosophy of life applies to this chapter. If we live our lives waiting to be saved by luck, we're powerless, aren't we? If we truly believe that luck is a force, if we truly believe that the only reason that there are certain people who are wealthy is because there is an entity or a form or a power or just dice rolls that make people wealthy, then that suggests that we are truly powerless over our destiny, which I don't believe that at all. I don't have any evidence to suggest that we are powerless in this modern era, in the Western world, in the best time in the history of the world to ever be alive. I don't believe that our destinies are bound up in luck. But if you do, well then yeah, you are a slave. To believe that luck is your future, that the only way you can get anywhere in life is through luck, is to be powerless. You are waiting for something to save you. But to ignore luck, or to recognize that luck is not found through chance, but through being a man of action, as the book talks about, then that gives you the power. And now all of a sudden, instead of your destiny being in somebody or something else's hands, it's now in your hands. That's the power of this chapter of this book. You want your circumstances to change? Don't rely on luck. Get to work. Go out and play the games that have the odds in your favor, such as getting a job. You know 99.99999% of the time when you have a job, you're going to get paid. Those are really good odds, 99.999% odds of getting paid for that work that you did. Pretty darn good odds, way better than what you'll find in Vegas. If you invest in the stock market, yes, the risk in the stock market is higher, but it's not a game of chance. If you don't know what you're doing, you're, if you're just, if you put up a stock list on a dartboard and you throw darts at it, that's just chance. But if you study and spend time or you give your money to those who do, such as in a mutual fund, then it's not a game of chance. It's a game of risk, which is different. Risk and chance are very, very different things. Putting your money where the odds are in your favor, such as investing, where you have a rate of return of 10% or so, the odds are in your favor that way. And that is where you find luck. That's what Arkad here is explaining to his students in this chapter. In the chapter, Arkad actually admits that he does ga uh, gamble on horse races, and somebody kind of calls him out on it, and Arkad admits freely, I've lost way more money than I've ever won on the horse races. It's just something you do for fun. And I mean, yeah, if you've got, if you've got the money and you like blackjack and you want to go play some blackjack, sure, I mean, who am I to say you can't do that? Kind of the heart of that question though is why are you doing it? If you're gambling for the sake of trying to earn wealth, it's a terrible, terrible, terrible idea because the odds are against you. If you are in the attempt of trying to earn wealth, your odds are much higher at getting a job, getting a second job, taking extra shifts, investing in sound financial opportunities, etc. The discussion here in the, in the auditorium progresses on and it kind of translates into this idea of procrastination. How important it is for us to make sure that we take advantage of financial opportunities that arise. And there are three stories that are presented here from three different people discussing opportunities that came to them and that they did not capitalize on. They hesitated, they weren't sure, they were a little nervous, they procrastinated, whatever it may be. The moral of these three stories boils down to this one line. I did permit good luck to escape. Again, we probably need to change our perception on what luck is. We probably think of luck as something that comes in and forcibly corrects our life for us. When the reality is, luck is often sitting there waiting for us to take it. It's, 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 it's not a perfect analogy, but the idea here is that luck is really more opportunity. And so if you want luck, then you take opportunity. 
picking up extra shifts, getting additional certifications, going to self-help classes, reading self-help books, all of these other things out there that can improve yourself, those opportunities are waiting there or they may pop up. And if you don't take them, if you procrastinate or miss them because you're afraid or nervous, you're missing out on your good luck. In this tale, we see how good luck waits to come to that man who accepts opportunity. Just in the next paragraph, it says, to take his first start to building an estate is as good luck as can come to any man. With all men, the, that first step, which changes them from men who earn from their own labor to men who draw dividends from earnings of their gold is important. In other words, he's again back to talking about the power of investing in compound interest. Money going into an investment that is collecting interest, that interest collects interest. This is what we call compound interest. This is where your money is making money for you instead of you being the one who has to do it. Does that not sound like a fantastic opportunity? Does that not sound like a fantastic opportunity? That you can take your money, put it into a relatively safe investment opportunity and just not even do anything with it. You're off on the golf course and your money is growing without you. Does that not sound fantastic? It is fantastic. And that's the kind of opportunity that brings us luck. On the topic of procrastination, a certain Syrian in the crowd says this, Opportunity, she will not wait for such slow fellow. She thinks if a man deserves to be lucky, he will step quick. I really like that idea. She thinks if a man desires to be lucky, he will step quick. If you really want to be lucky, take risks and snatch opportunities. Do not wait for luck to come rescue you. That is not how it works. The conversation progresses on to the power of making sure that you listen to your gut feeling. We're not saying make actions blindly, but the wisdom of making sure you don't second guess yourself out of good decisions. There's a story presented here where a certain individual was presented with a financial opportunity and it sounded good and he was ready to do it, but then he got a little nervous. He started second guessing himself and before he knew it, the opportunity was passed and now he's kicking himself because, man, that would have been fantastic. Here again, we have to ask ourselves the questions, are we taking the opportunities that are presented before us? Are you picking up your extra shifts? Are you applying for those extra jobs? Are you reading the books that you need to be reading to educate yourself? In today's era, with the internet in your pocket and the world's knowledge at your free disposal, more or less free, are you taking those opportunities? Because if you looked at today from 7,000 years ago, you would say, man, those people are lucky. Well, it wasn't luck that got us here. It was hard work, ingenuity, and inspiration, not luck. People had opportunities and they took them. That's not passive luck, that's active opportunity seeking. Ultimately, this chapter kind of finishes up on this idea that procrastination is our enemy, is an absolute enemy. You know that you're gonna to want to retire. Do not procrastinate starting to save for retirement. You know that your children are gonna to go to college. Do not procrastinate starting to save money for your kid's college. You know that there's a distinct possibility you're gonna end up in a nursing home someday when you're elderly. Don't procrastinate saving for that or getting the right insurance for it. Start working at it. Opportunity is there waiting for you to take it. We must be active participants in our destiny. Good luck, we do find, often follows opportunity. Men of action, please her best really like this chapter because it teaches us to take our destiny into our own hands and not wait for something or someone to save us through astronomically bad odds, but to take the sound odds that are right before us, all around us, and capitalize on them, to not procrastinate, but to act. Thus concludes our discussion of chapter four of The Richest Man in Babylon, Meet the Goddess of Good Luck. I'll see you in chapter five. Word.